I think the most exciting thing about my journey is that all I've ever really committed to is fearlessness. <laughs> if you are willing to read the books, to show up to these meetings, to knock on your neighbor's doors, you can affect change. And people sort of told me as I was starting to, to think about politics and get involved, they said, you'll be surprised if you show up over and over and over again. If you call enough, the decision makers will start to call you. And that happened. And it happened quickly. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Active Towns Podcast. My name is John Simmerman, and that is Molly Cook. Molly is running for State Senate 15 in the Houston area, and uh, she's going to be in a special election coming up here on May 4th, as well as a runoff uh, coming up after that. So let's hear from Molly. Molly Cook, thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns Podcast. Thank you. I'm so grateful to be here. Uh, so Molly, I love giving my guests an opportunity to introduce themselves real quickly. So let me turn the floor over to you. Who the heck is Molly Cook? I'm Molly Cook. I use she, her pronouns. I am an emergency room nurse and I've been a nurse for about 10 years. So that is the basis of everything that I do. Um, I've got a master's in public health policy from Johns Hopkins University. I've spent the last several years in Houston Harris County organizing mainly around transport transportation justice, but um, basically anything to do with public health, public safety, and environmental justice. And I ran for the Texas Senate in 2022 and primaried a longstanding incumbent with a lot of money and did pretty well against him. And then the seat went ahead and opened up. So now I'm back to close the deal in 2024 and hopefully bring nursing leadership and grassroots organizing into the Texas Senate. I love it. I love it. That's great. And in fact, let's go way back in time to this shot. Tell me about <laughs> who Molly is here. <laughs> That's baby Molly. My sister keeps all of our um, baby photos on her phone. So we love to use them when we have a chance. But I grew up in spring, so in the suburbs of Houston. And um, yeah, ended up going to college at UT in Austin and then moving inside the loop around 2014. Yay. Uh, yeah. So then you had mentioned uh, in, in your intro that you're a nurse, you're an emergency room nurse. Talk a little bit about that experience as a nurse and how that has sort of formed and shaped where you have headed in terms of uh, a desire to, well, actually, you know, before I even say that, I mean, I think that let's play this. Sure. This is a great. This is a great way to um, to sort of introduce you with that. It's only thirty seconds long, and then that'll give us an opportunity to chat a little more. When I clock in for work, I know every second counts. I'm Democrat Molly Cook, and in the ER, it's those seconds that can save a life, and the clock is always ticking in Texas. Will today be the day we're racing to save her after a miscarriage? repairing the damage of a gunshot wound, keeping neighbors alive after the power goes out. I'm Molly Cook, and I'm running for Texas Senate because we don't have any more time to wait. Boom. Look at that. That's awesome. <laughs> so that kind of answered it a little bit. Uh, expand upon that. Uh, how much of uh, you know being the training that you, that you have a, as a NERF has really sort of shaped and formed and dictated uh, your desire to run for, for Senate? To me, every bit of my experience as a nurse is going to directly translate into success as a legislator and lawmaker, as a public servant, as a leader. In the emergency department, you, um, you end up being a catch-all for folks. So the emergency department and jail are where people end up when we don't know what else to do with them or how to help them. And so you really see these policy failures play out. I have a front row seat to so many different policy failures in Texas playing all the way out in people's lives and ending up in, in a moment of injury or emergency, um, disease, fear, whatever it is. And so I know, I know what's going on. I know what's at stake. I know what people are dealing with that in every neighborhood at every income level because of that perspective that I have. Additionally, I know what my teammates are dealing with and what people who clock in and out of work every day are dealing with and how hard it is for physicians to practice medicine in Texas for a variety of reasons. So um, whether it's you know directly working on healthcare delivery reform or addressing public health issues or just being an effective 
teamwork <laughs> type of person, um, the emergency department is excellent training. And we work with a diverse set of teammates. We work with a diverse set of patients. And um, I'm not scared of that. I'm excited by that. And, you know, I work with Republican doctors. I work with Democrat doctors. And either way, we end up saving the lives at the end of the day. So to me, the emergency department is excellent training <laughs> for what I think I'll be facing in the Texas Senate. Yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. And uh, I, I kind of almost feel like I know you a little bit already. <laughs> and so, uh, And the reason I say that is because of this book that has recently come out, and you were prominently featured in Megan, Megan Kimball's book, City Limits. Um, I've already interviewed uh, Megan and profiled her here on the Active Towns channel. Uh, talk a little bit about, uh, you know, this experience, and, and I think that'll bring us around to uh, why transportation is a pretty central theme to the reason why you're, you are running. Yeah, so I worked on a med surge floor in Austin as a nurse uh, for about a year before moving back to Houston to fill my dream of becoming an emergency room nurse. And did that for about three years, worked nights, switched to days, um, really just kind of saw everything. And I felt my heart getting small because of the futility of trying to meet people's needs from the bedside. And so that's what prompted me to go back to school, get a public health degree, learn about systems thinking and how to address upstream issues for folks. And when I moved back to Houston, I was actually looking for ways to get involved in air quality to kind of bring this new knowledge of public health and community organizing and figure out how to, how to jump in and help shape change. And that led me to the I-45 fight. And that fight is extremely profound for me because I grew up in the suburbs on I-45 North. And I remember being seven years old in the car with my mother on the Hardy Toll Road, actually, um, but it's, it's uh, adjacent and parallel to, to I-45, and thinking, why did somebody build their house right next to a freeway? And of course they didn't. <laughs> the freeways were built very purposefully and violently through their neighborhoods and actually destroyed homes that used to stand right where we're driving. And so kind of coming to that understanding, learning about that process in public health school is very radicalizing for me. And when I came back to town and found out that TxDOT was going to re-injure those same communities and provide a very poor solution for a problem that frankly that they caused, um, I thought, well, this is an opportunity to be on the other side of this issue and hopefully make it right. And several years later, here we are. And um, I was very honored to be in Megan's book. She is an incredible journalist, very thoughtful, very thorough, and, and takes great care um, with the residents who are facing displacement and other folks who are in the book. Um, so it's a huge honor to have been a part of this fight, to have been a leader of a grassroots, totally volunteer group that has managed to hold off a needless highway expansion for years, and then to have that fight chronicled so that we can then provide hope to other cities who are doing the same thing and share what we've learned and what's worked so that maybe we can stop urban highway widenings in the United States. Yeah, yeah. and I, I have a little blurb here on screen right now that talks a little bit about uh, some of your most influential moments on your path to transportation agus, ad advocacy. Go ahead and, and take it away. We talk, talk a little bit more about this. This was an article by Doug Begley, who is the Houston Chronicle transportation reporter, and they kind of profiled um, multiple transportation leaders in Houston and Harris County. And the article specifically spoke to the diversity of the transportation leaders, which is, which is always a really exciting part of being in Houston. And I was very honored to be featured in this article because I came at this not as, you know, someone with an urban planning degree or not as someone who's worked for a city or a county for years, but as a nurse, as an emergency room nurse who just took an interest, who understands how this impacts people's daily lives and just decided to, to become a volunteer expert <laughs> in this issue area. And I always say that the main thing I've been able to offer to Stop Text I-45, the grassroots org I've been a part of in this fight, is my time and my energy. Nursing has provided flexibility, so I was able to show up to every meeting and take notes and um, to run meetings and to drive people around the state to go and advocate at the Capitol. And this little blurb right here is just kind of specifically about um, these intangible qualities of these land use decisions and these transportation decisions. 
that sort of planted these seeds in me that grew to a real passion for transportation advocacy. And um, I think things like traveling to a city that is very walkable um, gives you the ability to look back on your upbringing and think, wow, the suburbs actually weren't walkable. And it really impacted how I was able to interact with my peers of the world around me at you know, ages 13 through 15 when I didn't have a license yet and I didn't have a car. And so um, once you kind of reflect back on this, you understand the history of how we got where we are and what the motivations of decision makers were who built these urban highways, you really can't ever unsee it. <laughs> you just see everything as um, you know, either poor or excellent land use, and you see everything as an opportunity for more mobility, for safer transportation, and for deeper connectedness in our societies. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in that little blurb, it does uh, talk a little bit about uh, you you spending some time on the East Coast, uh, obviously here in Austin during college, uh, but then also in Western Europe. Uh, any places come to mind that were really influential uh, for sort of solidifying that that ability to to walk and bike and get to meaningful destinations under your own power? I remember being very young and taking a trip to New York City with my parents. You know, we went to see Empire State Building and um, a musical, et cetera. And it just blew my mind. I'd never been on a subway before. You know, I'm like nine or 10 or something, right? And had never been on a subway, had never really experienced that. And the idea that you could just walk out of your hotel or walk out of your house with your wallet, your keys, and your chapstick, <laughs> right? And your Metro card and just get around the entire city. Really just, I don't know, it made an impact on me. And then of course you end up walking three or four miles in a day and you're very hungry at the end of that. And you've gotten some exercise in without even meaning to. And you've seen all these sights along the way and you've, you've smelled things for better or for worse and you've interacted with people. It just gives you this sense of being a part of something bigger than yourself. And that's the same sense that I get when I hop on the train in the mornings and ride with all of these other people in scrubs to get to the medical center to go to my job. So it just sort of opens your eyes to the fact that there's a different way of doing this. And somebody made a decision to cover Houston and highways. It was not inevitable. Somebody made that decision and they are continuing to make those decisions and those decisions can change. Yeah, yeah. And they're continuing to, you know, to reemphasize, they're continuing to add more lane miles. They're continuing to expand these these highways. And that's one of the biggest challenges that uh, Megan, of course, uh, highlights in uh, in the book City Limits is the fact that TxDOT is continuing to expand uh, these highways. Uh, and, and they probably don't need to be doing that. Uh, so in Western Europe, is uh, any cities that really uh, pop uh, for you in terms of being inspirational for you? We visited London and France as, as a child of my parents, and um, London and Paris, excuse me. And then um, I visited Denmark sort of as a young adult and traveled around on my own and stayed with a couple that I'd met. Um, anyway, they, they gave me a car and a tent, et cetera. But when we were traveling around Denmark, yes, you use a car to get from city to city. But after that, you don't use it at all. And especially in Denmark, the bicycling was just next level. You could go anywhere on a path. There's bicycles to rent everywhere. It's just very low barrier to entry. And what's most exciting to me about what I felt in Copenhagen or other smaller cities in Denmark was that it was really any level of cyclist. It's not like you have to be a, an advanced cyclist or willing to sort of fight for your life amongst the cars or something like that, which is what we end up doing in Houston so much of the time. It was like you could put a child or you could put, you know, someone who hadn't ridden a bike much on these paths and they could safely move about town. And it wasn't just for recreation, although that was available as well. People are using this as their main form of transportation. And again, you're you're accidentally squeezing in movement and exercise. You're interacting with the people around you. You're sharing the common space. You're not isolated and you're not um, in you know, climate controlled environment. You're really a part of the world around you. And that was exciting to me, especially because specifically Denmark is not unlike Houston in a lot of ways, very flat coastal plains. Um, it's warmer here, but it, you know, it gets pretty warm there. And the population size of Houston is actually very similar to the population <laughs> size of Denmark as well. And so that to me, you know, I moved back home and I thought, wow, Houston should be the most bikeable city in the United States. 
And I don't want to hear it from people who talk about the heat because some of the highest ridership times um, for B cycle in Houston ever was August of 2020. It was really about people being off of work and having time to go and spend time outdoors. Um, we we will bike in the heat, and that was just very eye opening, exciting, and I was glad to bring that ethos back home with me. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad you mentioned, uh, you know, that you know the pathways that can be built uh, can be multifunctional. They can be used for uh, recreation purposes, of course, you know, sport and recreation. But they can also be used for utilitarian purposes. Uh, I know when I interviewed um, Commissioner Rodney Ellis uh, here on the podcast, we talked about the power of you know getting those bayou paths, um, you know, established, and then starting to get into the on street network and creating safe and inviting all ages and abilities facilities and again not for necessarily the confident uh sport you know cyclists really talking about doing this so that we can uh sort of empower everyone to ride just like in this photo here from your 2022 run is is like, you know, get out on the B cycle bike and, you know, and, and, or pull that bike out of your garage and ride. It, it, it doesn't matter what you're wearing. It, you know, it doesn't have to be fancy, but it's, it's so empowering to be able to get to meaningful destinations. Yeah. And it's really wild too. A friend of mine who's an expert estimated that overhauling the entire bike network of Houston, probably being fairly inclusive of, of a lot of Harris County and, and towns within Harris County that aren't Houston as well. 450 million, something like that, um, which is a chunk of change, right? But it just pales in comparison to, we're estimating now $12 billion to widen 24 and a half miles of road to make it objectively less safe and um, increase flooding and all of that. So we could take cars off the road. We could give people the enjoyable experience of being able to cycle around and get to their jobs, et cetera, which, which I also do. I either take a bike or transit to work. Um, it's the easiest, cheapest, and fastest way. And that's the reality. You don't have to pay for parking. You don't have to haul your car around with you. So um, I'm very grateful to, to Commissioner Ellis's leadership on all of this. And he's right. And we can do so much better for, for way cheaper. Yeah. And and I like the the fact that you you sort of uh, you know channeled a little bit of the 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 Denmark the Danes sort of approach to it uh, because some of the words that you just used there are also like really resonate with fiscally conservative thought processes is that you know part of the reason why riding a bike in and using public transit you know in Denmark is so prevalent is that it's just practical and it's pragmatic and it's cost effective. I mean, these are all, you know, values and virtues that I think, you know, if if we just kind of get away from the rhetoric, it, it crosses party lines. And it's like, yeah, no, this is actually something good for everyone and it's good for business and it's fiscally conservative too. I think so too. And I think that's one of the big reasons I want to, there's a lot of issues for Democrats in Texas, as you can imagine, but transportation feels like a real opportunity for bipartisan work for exact, exactly the same reasons that you're talking about. Um, we just need somebody in that chamber who's willing to say, look, it is wild that Texas is the only state without dedicated public transit funding. That's wild. 49 other states have realized that this is something we need from a state level for safety, which is absolutely multipartisan, right? Everybody values safety. And then like you're talking about, this is good for small businesses. This is good for um, this is good for our cities and Texas is very big and diverse. And so there's, there's always kind of this rural, suburban, urban divides, right? That, that we end up having to kind of find, um, compromises, et cetera. And I think allowing some local control in our urban centers would be huge. And we need a champion for that because rural communities and urban communities absolutely need different solutions for safety, for pro-business policy, for um, for mobility throughout the region. But our urban centers, um, they don't need wider freeways. <laughs> we need someone in there who's willing to to do the hard work of getting across the aisle and making that clear. Yeah. And we'll we'll pop on over and talk a little bit about um, the I-45 fight a, a little bit more extensively in just a moment. But uh, bring us up to speed with what Prop B was all about. Prop B um, was a 
I always tell people this is the work of a lifetime. If I if I died today, I would be so proud that we passed probably I did enough. Um, and I love this picture on the screen, not just because David and I are wearing matching chucks, but um, just the, the sheer amount of sweat on both of us is just really indicative of the labor of love that was passing Prop B. So Houston and Harris County make up over 65% of the population of our region. And our region is like, you know, Galveston to Conroe, uh, kind of Pasadena to, to Katy area. So um, we have these regions of Texas and every region has a big city in it because of federal law. If the city is big enough, your regional council of governments is also your metropolitan planning organization. So our COG slash MPO is the Houston Galveston Area Council or HGAC. So Houston Harris County make up all of, you know, 65% of the population. We have less than 20% of the voting power on either of those boards. And that's a huge issue nationwide. And people have tried to address it from the federal level, you know, in, in multiple ways over the last several decades since these were kind of created in the 50s. Um, and it's, it's a nationwide pervasive problem. It's a problem of environmental justice. It's a problem of racial justice. And it's a problem of economic justice. But it's also just basically bad government, right? It's kind of this taxation without representation. You don't have a fair say over what happens to you. And so multiple times in the last few years that we've been really paying close attention, the Houston and Harris County representation on that board got outvoted. One of those votes was to widen I-45 to, to kind of invest those local dollars in widening I-45. One of those votes screwed Houstonians out of basically any of the flood recovery money from Harvey, despite the vast majority of damage happening to Houstonians. And there are a couple of other kind of smaller example, examples of projects that um, either didn't get scheduled or didn't even get proposed within kind of the inner loop, the urban core of, of Houston. And we are, we're tired of it. We're tired of not being represented fairly and having our elected leaders be able to make their voices heard. And so... Um, you know, we'd been paying attention to these huge, huge public health issues and thought we need a change. And the change coming from the top down has not worked. Why don't we do from the bottom up? And I'm a big believer in bottom up planning policy and projects um, and the grassroots approach. And so a, a scrappy group of volunteers got together and said, I think we can fix this by changing the Houston Charter. And the reason for that is federal law requires that if, if you've got a big city, your metropolitan planning organization actually requires the participation of that big city, the principal city of the region. And so without the participation of Houston, potentially our MPO or HGAC would face sort of this existential crisis. And the idea is to leverage the very real power that our city has, um, not just because of the way federal laws are written, but because we are the source of the federal funding <laughs> that is getting drawn down. We're the population, we're the tax base, and we're also the seat of diversity for the region. We're the beating heart of the region. And so we need to kind of claim our seat. And we amended the city of Houston charter to say that in order for us to participate, all HGAC has to do is adopt a proportional voting system. This was wildly popular as, it, as shown by the 65% that we passed by um, and a bipartisan coalition that we were able yeah. to. So, and, 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 and this is the signatures, delivering the signatures to get it onto the ballot. And uh, this is you during, you know, the, uh, you know uh, I think this was, uh, you know, campaigning out there uh, on voting day, correct? Yes. Yep. A excellent. And then the celebration, because yes, it passed. 23,000 signatures, 250 volunteers, 65% of the vote. It was huge. Um, the fight is still ongoing. People rarely release power <laughs> without a fight, but that's how these things go. You know, you got to pay close attention for a long time. And we're, we're really um, just our spirits are buoyed by how hard our elected officials have fought for us, have done the right things and said the right things. And we trust that this process is going to work out in the end. So you mentioned that it's not over. Um, yeah, uh, th that's a good point. I mean, the status quo never relinquishes power uh, easily. So I, I suspect that that's going into some sor sort of appeal process uh, or they're going to try to uh, not bow to the will of the voters. Is that what you're inferring? They're, yeah, in negotiations still. Mm, okay. <sighs> Interesting. Ah, okay, so... Let's shift gears to the fact that you got inspired and became a freeway fighter. <laughs> <laughs> These are some buttons from the Freeder, Free, uh, Freeway Fighters uh, conference that you uh, attended. Where was this at? 
This one was in Cincinnati, Ohio, and it was the first ever kind of of this era, first ever national freeway fighters conference. So people gathered from you know, Houston, New Orleans, the Twin Cities, Cincinnati, Portland, all over. And we kind of got together and I just, this picture makes me cry <laughs> just to look at it. It was so special. Um, got together and just kind of compared notes and talked about the different freeway fights that are happening in basically every major city in the United States and, and where each one is at and what the the political culture and landscape looks like and how we can all stick together and help each other and, and believing in a safer, more mobile future for all of our cities. Yeah, I, I zoomed in just a little bit because I do recognize a few faces in there. So I, I kind of hang out with, with y'all, the, the freeway <laughs> fighters. <laughs> Bring us up to speed with what's going on with uh, the, the stop text dot uh, I-45 fight. And I am very blessed to say that I'm not even the most up-to-date person right now because I am focused so fully on campaigning for state Senate. And in my absence, the group has just continued to thrive. It's just such a mark of good organizing that um, even if sort of one of your you know point people leaves, the group continues to thrive. That's awesome. Um, this picture is from 2020. This was our day at the park. It was in November of 2020. And we gathered in a green space that will be just really, um, I don't want to say destroyed, but that it's hard to find another word. There will be 34 lanes over, over the screen space where there's a beautiful skyline, et cetera. And so we gathered there to highlight how we cherish these screen spaces and we want them preserved and categorized as parks. And they should not, um, they should be protected from the impacts of, of freeway projects like this. And, um, you know, I kind of came on board in July of 2019. It was a big vote at the Houston Galveston Area Council to, to commit that local funding. And we have done everything we've taken to the streets. This was a chalk project that we did. Um, and then, of course, our, a lot of our entire fight is chronicled in City Limits by Megan Kemble. But we have just kept the pressure on for years. We filed, um, we helped residents who are affected by this project file Title VI complaints, so sort of invoking um, the Department of Justice to review TxDOT's process and see if there were um, there were issues with racial discrimination, which we still maintain that there are. Um, so we've advocated at the city, county, regional, state, and federal level to try to get some common sense transportation policies out of the Texas Transportation Commission and TxDOT. Um, and the fight is very much alive and still very much exciting and focused on a really vibrant future for not just our city, but every city in Texas. Yeah, yeah. So to close us out, um, why don't you take this opportunity to, to really um, uh, talk a little bit about why other people in other cities should be Molly Cooks and get inspired to run for office? I think the most exciting thing about my journey is that all I've ever really committed to is fearlessness. <laughs> If you are willing to read the books, to show up to these meetings, to knock on your neighbor's doors, you can affect change. And people sort of told me as I was starting to, to think about politics and get involved, they said, you'll be surprised if you show up over and over and over again. If you call enough, the decision makers will start to call you. And that happened. And it happened quickly. When you, when you prove to someone that you're, you're for the people, you're coming at this from a public health or nursing or people-driven standpoint, if you do the research and you work hard and you commit to communicating with people and knocking on their doors, maybe communicating in multiple languages, um, sort of sticking to some very basic values of good organizing, your movement will grow, your movement will grow, and you can affect change. And I've shown that same kind of dedication um, and sort of relentlessness at the Texas Capitol and helped pass bipartisan legislation last session. So the sky is the limit if folks are just willing to believe in themselves, hope for a better future, and then do some hard work to make it happen. And um, as a grassroots organizer and bedside nurse looking at a Texas Senate seat and a runoff for a Texas Senate seat, um, I'm really excited to be sort of a model for anybody else who wants to, to stick their boot in the door and, <laughs> and take their seat at the table and do the hard work and, and, and make change happen around them. Yeah. And I love your story too, because, you know, it, it kind of echoes what I try to 
uh, emphasize here on the channel when people say, well, we're, we're just exasperated, we're frustrated with the, the lack of progress. And one of the first things that I say is get involved, get engaged, start talking to your neighbors. And I know that that was a big part of your journey was you, you started you know, questioning, well, why is it this way? And does it have to be this way? And starting to reach out, starting to talk to your neighbors, starting to get engaged with community outreach. And then, you know, if that if that lights a fire and that encourages you to, to, to run for office, perfect, because that's exactly what we need, is we need more people who can really see these things and the nuances and the difficulty uh, that that elected officials have to face we need more people running that are like that. So I, I applaud you, and, and hopefully that's encouraging to the viewers and listeners uh, here to this episode. Absolutely. And just, you know, there's so much emphasis in mainstream media on federal politics, on federal policy. And yes, all of that impacts our daily lives in a huge, huge way. But local politics and state legislatures are the laboratories. That is where policy is born and challenged and shaped. And it is so important to put um, to put our people on the inside, like you're talking about, and not just at these higher levels that get all of the attention from the media, but also at the more local levels um, where people are are kind of shaping and and you know developing policies that will trickle up, but also just passing policies that have a huge impact on you. So I encourage people. Um, I find it much more satisfying, um, <laughs> a, little, a little bit more fun uh, to stay kind of focused on local politics. And that's worked out really well for me. And so I encourage other people to do the same. Don't be afraid to just start small. It's, it's way easier to make an impact on the local level uh, when you're starting out than it is on the federal level. And it's still so important and can save lives. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Again, this has been um, Molly Cook. She is running for the state Senate in Sen Senate District 15. Her website is mollyfortexas.com. Molly, thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. And best of luck uh, in this runoff, uh, or excuse me, in this, uh, what would we call the, the May 4th? Is this the... Uh, we should, yeah, real quick, we should do logistics on this. Yeah, we have a Texas two-step in May for Senate District 15. So the special election is May 4th, and that election will fill the seat for the remainder of this year. And then the runoff is on May 28th. And we're in a runoff because nobody got over 50% in the first round. So my opponent and I advanced to that one. So um, if folks want to see a freeway fighter and transportation enthusiast in the Texas Senate, they should show up and vote on May 4th and again on May 28th. And I'm dancing here because you said the, te the Texas two-step. All right, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> again, thank you so much, Molly, uh, for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. Thank you so much. So glad to be here. Hey, thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Molly Cook. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up. Leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, I'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just click on that subscription button down below and ring that notifications bell. And if you are in the District 15 <laughs> down there in Molly's district, be sure to vote. Uh, and uh, hopefully this was helpful to you all. And for those of you tuning in from around the country and around the world, uh, hopefully Molly's story is an inspiration for you to get engaged and involved within your own community. Again, thank you so much for tuning into this special episode, election season episode. I really do appreciate it. And until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.